Now, technology does not only exist in a static manner. Technology obviously also evolves, for example, from the time when Mr. Martin Cooper invented the mobile phone in 1973 at a company called Motorola. The mobile phone has evolved a lot and extremely rapidly. For example, check out this commercial, which is not from too long ago. And mobile phones continue to evolve incessantly. For example, the iPhone, from the iPhone from the first generation to the iPhone 3, then the iPhone 4, the iPhone 5, the iPhone 6, 6 Plus, and so forth. Mobile phones continue to evolve. So the basic question is, how does technology evolve? Is there something we can say about the nature of this evolution? So let's look at that. Let's take a typical need, for example, how to store sound for later consumption. Um, this is a typical need and we have a performance indicator on the y-axis here. And we will hope that as technology evolves, this performance indicator goes up and there have been several different ways of how to address this typical need. Starting with the tinfoil wrap, then the vinyl record, the cassette tape, the CD, the MP3, they're all derived from knowledge about the world uh, and embedded in different physical structures. So the basic question is now, what is the trajectory of this technological evolution that we normally intuitively understand? Is it more a linear evolution? Technology gets better over time in a linear way. Is it a decreasing return curve, which means that technology gets better, but always less? Or are there increasing returns to the evolution of technology? That means as time passes on, technology gets increasingly better and always makes larger steps. So let's look at the technological trajectory. As a first step, let's map it out empirically. So in 1877, Edison invented the tinfoil wrap. That was the first time we could store audio for later consumption. Before that, if you wanted to hear Mozart, you had to listen to Mozart playing. And actually, we don't have a record of Mozart playing because Mozart was before the tinfoil wrap. And then we were for the first time able to store audio, indistinguishable from magic for the first generation in 1877. Then came the vinyl record in 1930, a cassette tape in 1963, CD 1980s, MP3 in the 1990s. And we have these different curves of technologies where if technology, a new technology is born, a solution to a typical need is born, and then kind of like dies off and it's getting replaced. So it's an evolution in these discrete steps. One thing that is noticeable is that these steps always seem to become shorter. So from the tinfoil wrap to the vinyl record, it took 53 years. From the vinyl record to the cassette tape, only 33 years. From the cassette tape to the CD, only 17 years, then only 50. So things seem to become faster and faster. Innovation cycle seems to become shorter and change seems to accelerate. That's the first very important insight. If we now take the average curve along this trajectory, we have actually the curve of technological progress and it is characterized by two characteristics. One, the progression seems to increase, so there is an exponential logic to it. We will talk more about this later. And this evolution seems to go in discrete chumps. So two very important first insights we already have about how technology evolves. Somebody who has been a very well-known and long-term advocate for the accelerating and exponentially increasing nature of technological change is the inventor and visionary and author Ray Kurzweil, also director of engineering at Google. And here in his own words, what he has to say about the accelerating nature of technological change. So where does this accelerating and exponential nature of technological change come from? And, and how? Now, the secret lies in 
combinations. You have probably heard the basic formula of combinatorics in high school. That's the thing with the n choose k, which is like n factorial divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial. But a very intuitive way to think about it is to think about the probably most prolific inventor of all times, Thomas Edison, with more than a thousand inventions in the United States alone. So how did Edison invent his things? Well, the Edison's Menlo Park Laboratory occupied two city blocks. Edison said he wanted the lab to have a stock of almost every conceivable material. It contained more than 8,000 kind of chemicals, every kind of screw made, every size of needle, every kind of cord or wire, hair of humans, horses, hawks, cows, rabbits, goats, minks, camels, silk in every texture, cocoons, various kinds of hoof, shark teeth, deer horns, tortoise shells, cork, resin, resin varnish and oil, ostrich feathers, peacock's tails, jet, amber, rubber, all kind of ores, everything in his laboratory. And, and why did he hoard all of that? Well, he basically used them and to combine them. He looked for new combinations of things. And that's actually what invention consists of, new combinations. For example, back in the days, electricity was already around and it was suggested that, well, one could use electricity to get light out of it. Obviously, we knew that lightnings have something to do with light, but nobody knew how to do it. So Edison took on the task and, of course, worked on this kind of problem. And after a while, he seemed to fail a lot of times. He just took uh, electricity and ran it through hoofs and shark teeth and ostrich feathers and peacock tails. A lot of things got burned, but nothing really worked. So after a while, people came to him and said, well, it must have been like 10,000 times that you tried this thing now. You failed 10,000 times. When were you willing to give up? And he said, I have not failed 10,000 times. I have not failed once. I have successfully found 10,000 ways that will not work. And that gives you a deep insight about how Edison thought about what invention actually is. He just looked for a combination of things and then discarded the combinations that did not work to continue. Eventually, he figured out, well, if you take a certain kind of wire and kind of like twist it up and you put it into a glass bowl, then you can get it live. But there were many combinations he tried before. That's also why Edison always used to say that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So 1% inspiration, 99% pure sweat. Uh, as a scholar and an academic and as a student, you might have something to say about that. And actually, that's what it really is. Now, let's have a look at how combinatorics works a little bit more. It has a lot to do with the number of choices that you have. So if you take, for example, Edison's 8,000 kind of chemicals, and we choose one kind of chemical, well, we have 8,000 choices, right? What if we say from the 8,000 chemicals, we take two different ones? It turns out that if you run this little formula, N, the N choose K formula, um, you have 32 million choices of combining two different chemicals out of 8,000. That is 8,000 choose two. If you now choose three of them, you already have 85 billion choices. And if you choose four out of the 8,000, you have 170 trillion. There's 170 million, million ways you can choose four chemicals out of 8,000. So that's the power of combinatorics. And it still works today. Check out what many people say is the best presentation ever given. The day the legendary Steve Jobs presented for the first time the iPhone. The day that Apple reinvented the phone. And guess how Apple did it? Check it out. It has a lot to do with finding new combinations.
So a definition of innovation is that it consists in carrying out new combinations. This definition code goes back to Joseph Schumpeter. And it is very insightful because it tells us that an innovation is a new combination, a recombination of things. So there is nothing ever new. All we do is recombine it. And since combinatorics, following this formula, follows an exponential logic, technological change has this exponential nature to it. So let's look a little bit deeper actually on how this works and how we can think about it. So let's say we first of all start with nothing. The number of combinations we can do with it is one. We actually only have one choice and that is to do nothing. Now if we have one input, we have one thing, we have already two choices. We can either take it or not. Now, if we have two things, for example, we have a triangle and a circle, we already have four choices because we can either not take anything or we can take both or we can take the triangle or we can take the circle. So there are four number of possible combinations. Now, if we have three inputs, a square, a triangle, and a circle, how many combinations do we have? Why don't you go ahead and count it? Well, we can either take nothing, we can take the square, the triangle, or the circle. We can take the square and the triangle. We can take the square and the circle. And we can take the triangle and the circle, or we can take all three of them. So there are eight possible combinations that we can do with three inputs. Now let's say we have four inputs, a heart, a square, a triangle, and a circle. How many combinations can we do with those four? You want to count them or you want to guess? And now we have five different inputs. How many combinations can we do with them? You're still invited to count or you can also simply guess. Now this sequence of 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 is called an exponential sequence because they are the result of exponentiation. So 2 to the 0 is 1, 2 to the 1 is 2, 2 to the power of 2, that means 2 times 2 is 4, 2 to the power of 3 means we have 2 times 2 times 2, 3 times 2 with itself is 8, 2 to the power of 4, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 is 16 and 2 to the power of 5 is 32. So since this is in the exponent, we call this exponential growth. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. One interesting thing to notice about exponential series is the step size of progress. So between the first two steps, between 1 and 2, the step size is 1. Then between 2 and 4, the step size gets 2, then the step size gets 4, then the next step, just by adding one more block of input to combine with, we make a step of 8 already, and then just by adding one additional input block, we make a step of 16. So while we have a linear progression, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, with regard to the input blocks, we have an exponentially increasing number of steps in the outcome which also means that in the same number of steps, much more things can happen. So between step four and five, I can invent 16 different things. That is a lot of things that are happening there. And that's why it seems to us that progress is accelerating, that it's always faster. Because back in the day, let's say between the year zero and the year 1000, well, only one or two or three things happened. And 
Nowadays, a lot of things are happening in a shorter time frame. Where does it come from? From combinatorics, nothing else. This logic of combinatorics, of simply combining different building blocks and with that having the outcome of an accelerating nature of change, that is omnipresent in our universe. Actually, let's look at the universe. Things are also always getting faster and faster in the universe. Or to say in other words, in the same amount of time, more things are happening. So if we take the universe history and from the Big Bang until now and push it together into the equivalent of one year, that's what it would look like. On January 1st, for New Year's, the Big Bang happened. Then it would take four months until the origin of the Milky Way. That's a long time without nothing happening. Then on September 9th, we have the origin of our solar system. On September 14th, the formation of Earth. Life on Earth would start on September 25th. Well, that is pretty far advanced already in the year. The oldest fossils, they date back to October 9th. Then come, come the first cells, the Cambrian explosion, the dinosaurs. The, what? What? The dinosaurs? They would come into the scene basically in December and they would go extinct on December 30th. On December 30th. That's a, a day before uh, the year ends. The first humans would come onto the scene on December 31st at 10.30 p.m. That's an hour and a half before midnight. The first stone tools would come about at 11 p.m. The first cave paintings, uh, a couple of minutes before midnight, the Chinese dynasties, the dynasties in Egypt, Babylon, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, that would be less than 10 seconds before midnight. Then the Roman Empire, that was the time Jesus Christ was on this planet, that would be four seconds before midnight, and all the rest of what we call modern civilization, well, basically, we have to cramp that into the last second. So things got pretty hectic there at the end. And where does it actually come from? Well, very fundamentally and basically, it comes from the fact that there are more building blocks and we can recombine more building blocks. And with that, combinatorics leads to this accelerating nature of progress. That's where it comes from. Now, that's already a lot to wrap your head around, I know. But there's one more rather technical issue I, I, I wanted to, to, to explain to you. And that's because when you often see these graphs on exponential progress, be it on technological progress or, or whatever, you often see that people use the logarithm on the vertical axis on the y-axis. <clears throat> so what does the logarithm have to do with that? Well, the logarithm is kind of like the opposite of exponentiation, similar as the multiplication is the opposite of division or subtraction is the opposite of addition. It kind of like reverts it. So if the logarithm of a certain base is taken on the number that is below in the exponentiation, it basically eliminates it. Same as I, I multiply with something and then I would divide through it. So it's kind of like the opposite of it. That's what I mean by that. So if you, we always had a doubling rate, we had a doubling rate, we had two to the power of something. Now we take the logarithm of the base of two and it basically, it goes away. And all we're left with is a linear series. So while originally we have one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, and we would get a graph that kind of like looks like this, shoots up. If we take the logarithm on the vertical axis, we eliminate this two and all we count is the number of inputs. One, two, three, four, five, with the result of having a linear line. That means also that the logarithm that you take, the base of the logarithm that you take, that determines what kind of process you have, what kind of exponential process you are measuring. And all exponential growth can be represented as a doubling process. And that's very intuitive. Things just double. So in our case, uh, things just double. Two, four, eight, sixteen. So if you take the logarithm of two, you identify the doubling rate of this process. That's where it comes from. 
So to give you an idea, this here is a graph of Ray Kurzweil. Basically, what Ray Kurzweil here did is he took any event in the history of the universe when something happened. For example, the solar system was born, the printing press was invented, the French Revolution started, and he just put it all together in one graph. And that's the graph he got. It's, uh, you cannot really see anything with it because things uh, go so slowly and then suddenly, like on the time until now, they, they, it becomes a straight, straight li line down. So basically what then people often do, as I told you, they take the logarithm on this side. And now he has on this, on this y-axis the time to the next event. And on the x-axis he has the time before present. So these are all the events every time something happened in the history of the universe. And it is an impressively straight line. It's, it's really impressive that all these random events lead to these very smooth exponential logic. I said things always become fast and actually my grandma always used to say that this seems like things are always becoming faster now and my grandma was absolutely right. This is not just uh, a random illusion. No, it is really, it is the nature of how things are going. For example, take a guess. How long did it take from the domestication of fire? So when humankind was living in the caves and took the fire to the caves, but did not know yet how to start the fire. So the forest was burning because a lightning struck. They ran, they captured a fire, they brought it back to the cave, they domesticated it. So they had fire in their cave, but it could not go out because nobody had any idea of how to start it. So that's why actually we men, we were usually sitting in front of the cave, also at night, protecting the fire. It was very valuable, this fire. By the way, anthropologists, they say that's also why men actually have this addiction of watching sports. And we cannot stand it if somebody then talks to us while we do that. Basically, what we do is we stare into the fire. We did that for a long time, sitting outside the cave, just staring into the fire. And don't talk to me because basically I'm asleep. Hopefully not a lot happens on the TV. The idea is not watching the TV. The idea is to stare into the fire. And anthropologists say that's actually that's where we have that from. So for a long time, we stared into the fire. We tried to protect it because we didn't know how to start it. So how many years do you think passed from the domestication of fire until we discovered how to start fire? ourselves. And bear in mind, back in these days, we already had stone tools. So sparks were flying around. How many years do you think passed? A hundred and fifty thousand years. We were pretty much monkeys. That's <laughs> just a fact. I mean, these are many... Jesus Christ, that was two thousand years ago. 150,000 years. That's a really long time. Now, how many years do you think passed from the first time humankind took the first flight, when the brother Wright took the first flight of uh, 120 feet of 30 meters until we flew to the moon? 66 years. Isn't that impressive? That means that before that, we had no ideas even to make a jump of 30 meters of 120 feet. In 66 years, we flew to the moon. Well, things always become faster and faster and faster. And you can think about it in a logic of combinatorics.